Hey there and welcome into Main Street Living. I'm Danielle Barry and as you can see we have a very special host back in the house. <laughs> hey guys I'm Cheryl Nelson. I've missed you. Hey oh, Cheryl what's going so on? Much. I'm Quincy Carr and I'm so happy to be back right next to this young lady right here. So good 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 to have you back. A little fuzzy but that's okay right? Yeah, we'll take I'm fuzzy not. Cheryl. Yeah. I know. Apparently my internet took a vacation and it's still waking back up. So uh, we're trying to get that working for you. Hopefully if it's not better this time, next time we'll have a clearer picture. But yeah, guys, um, unfortunately I went from being perfectly healthy um, back in January to getting a pretty severe illness. Um, it was not COVID. It was a different type of virus, uh, which led mm -hmm. to some surgeries and complications and weight loss and you know, I'm still recovering. I'm still fighting it, but I've got some energy back. I'm feeling better. And I'm so happy to be back with you both on Main Street Living. And it's just a reminder too, that don't ever take your health for granted because mm -hmm. this came out of nowhere. So keep those doctor's appointments. Always have health insurance. Health insurance saved my life. I can't even tell you how much we would have owed. Mm -hmm. So just do what you can, you know, be proactive and take care of yourselves. That's yeah, so important. Like, I love I'm so I'm so happy you're back, Cheryl, and I'm I'm glad you're feeling a little bit better, a little bit better every day, hopefully. Yeah, Thank and you. what and what a lot of people don't know about Cheryl that me and Danielle knows is this 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 lady is such a fighter, and oh. we're we're watching her from from the outside, and 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 she's just encouraging us. Hey guys, you know I'm fighting every day. I'm gonna be great. So we're glad to have you back, Cheryl. And, and hopefully out traveling again soon because we know you got yeah. the travel bug. She's always on the go. So we got to get her so back. Thank you so much. Yes, I need that. <laughs> and speaking of on the go, guys, we gotta go because we got a great show coming up for you. Oh, that's right. That's right. We're gonna see the impact of teachers and what they have on our kids and how living and spending money is a real thing in the metaverse. We'll visit with our AAPI community and our tax expert is back to answer all of our small business questions. And we'll dive into the water crisis in the Southwest. But first, we'll tell you how all kids can step onto a field of dreams. Stay with us. Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, uh, Danielle, Cheryl, uh, it's well known that playing sports is great for all of us, but especially for kids. Lifelong lessons of teamwork, perseverance, and staying fit. Those are just a few things kids can learn while playing on a neighborhood sports team. That's right, but unfortunately, kids with physical or intellectual disabilities are often left out of team sports. An organization called the Miracle League is working to ensure that all kids have the chance to be part of the team. Dan Engel is here to talk with us about this incredible group. Welcome to Main Street Living, Dan. Hey, thanks so much for having me this morning. I uh, really so, appreciate it. Yeah, well, no, we so appreciate you. And, and for those viewers who may not be familiar, what can you tell us about the Miracle League? Yes, yeah, so the Miracle League of San Diego provides children and adults with special needs the opportunity to play baseball in an organized league. We have two seasons, uh, spring and fall. We have two fields here in San Diego County. And what makes it unique is every player has a buddy who helps them on and off the field, provides encouragement, um, and, and just support where needed. And that, what's so important of that is it gives parents the opportunity for just an hour to sit and watch their kids and, and sometimes adult, we have players in their forties, um, be able to smile and know that their child is taken care of and they can just talk to other parents in similar situations. It's the happiest place in San Diego. Oh, and that must feel so nice for the parents too, to know that their kid has a buddy and the kid is having fun. Tell us more about this buddy program and yeah. what it means to both the players and the buddies. Yeah, thanks so much for asking that. To me, I like to say that we're nurturing philanthropic souls. We're mm. teaching kids at a young age how good it feels to give back and help someone else. So it benefits them when we start as early as 10 years old. And they develop confidence and the ability to communicate with others who sometimes don't speak. You know, a lot of our kids are nonverbal. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot they've got to figure out other ways. You know, I'd say about a third of our population is Down syndrome. A third 
uh, somewhere on the autism spectrum and then cerebral palsy and you, you name it. We've, we've got someone with some kind of disability out on our field. Hmm. I love that. And I think it's so important that kids spend time with people that are different from them, of course, especially at a young age and, and just be able to learn uh, about empathy and everything. You have a very special event coming up this weekend. Uh, what can you tell us about the exhibition game and the celebrity home run tournament? Yeah, that's great. It's it's our 15 year anniversary. The San Diego Padres have been our partner from oh. day one. Uh, we opened on May 19th, 2007. So May 22nd, Sunday, May 22nd, uh, starting at 12 noon at San Diego Park uh, in, in North County, San Diego, is our exhibition game and celebrity home run derby. We're going to have one player from every team in the league, and their buddies are going to be local celebrities, including uh, 10 uh, San Diego Padres alum. We have football players, including Drew Brees. Uh, we have Jane Mitchell, a, a, a really... Uh, great journalist here in San Diego has been involved with the Padres. And after the exhibition game, we're going to roll into a home run derby fundraiser where the celebrities are going to use the same bats and balls that our kids use and compete to see who can hit the most home runs. And people will be able to donate dollars and pledge dollars for every home run hit by their favorite celebrity. So whether it's uh, someone like, uh, uh, Mark Loretta or Troy Gloss, who's a big home run hitter for the Angels, Carlos Quinton, Tim Stauffer, X Nady, Charlie Nagy, Corey Lubke, uh, Rick Aguilera, Russell Allen, uh, Stephen Cooper, who's a linebacker for the Chargers, uh, Steve Finley, Tyler Gaffney, uh, who was one of our very first buddies. It's a great opportunity to support the Miracle League. And what's great is if you can't attend in person at San Diego Park, uh, it's going to be live streamed uh, through an app that we have called Rally Up, where you're also able to pledge dollars right now for home runs that people hit. So you could go to that app and uh, pledge home runs now. I've already backed Melissa McElvain, who's a USD softball coach, really successful. And I think she can hit a lot of home runs. If you want to donate a lot of money to the Miracle League, back Troy Gloss or Steve Finley or Mark Loretta or Carlos Quinton or Exit, lots of guys. It's just going to be super fun experience. The Padres are presenting the event for us. It's it's just uh, I can't I can't tell you what it feels like uh, after 15 years. When we first started, we had 80 players in the league on on eight teams. We now have 300 players on 22 teams at our two locations. Mm. It's it's amazing. Oh, I can I can feel your passion for this, and I'm so glad the Padres are involved and play such a big role. And I'm curious: is the Miracle League only in San Diego, or are absolutely other not? Involved? It's it's actually international. It started okay. uh, in a suburb of Atlanta called Conyers, Georgia, and and if if you. Google the, the Frank DeFord piece on HBO's Real Sports with Brian Gumbel on the Miracle League. You'll fall in love and understand why we started the Miracle League here in San Diego. Well, so how can viewers get involved or support the mission of the Miracle League? That, that's a great question. So obviously you can go to our website. We're going to be opening registration for the coming season in the next two weeks. Uh, so you could go to the website. You can register as a buddy. You can register as a coach. Uh, if you've got a, a, a player, register a player. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, and then also through the Rally Up website, mlsd.rallyup.com, you can pledge dollars per home run hit by your favorite celebrity. I'm, I'm counting on you two to put some money behind, uh, uh, I'm going to say, Tyler Gaffney. Uh, mm. You know, the, he played, you know, professional football and baseball. So, and and one of our first buddies, which is so near and dear to my heart. Oh, Danielle, you're the sports expert. What do you think? I know I'll have to make some some odds, some lines for everybody. I'll see over unders for how many home runs we're going to see. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you in the past, uh, we've had some guys hit as many as 25. Wow. And, and we've had some as few as one. So you do have the opportunity to pledge a fixed dollar amount and not take that risk. We're grateful for any support we oh. can get. It's it's just really, you know, 
come on out. It's the happiest place in San Diego, and I can't wait for the next 15 years. Love it. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. What a treat. We appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I, I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, coming up, Danielle, we're going to make some more miracles. We'll meet an amazing teacher who has gone above and beyond for his students. You'll want to see this. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Now, we know the pandemic changed our focus on a lot of different topics, but one thing that became clear over the past couple of years is how incredibly important teachers are and what a huge impact they have on kids. That's right, Danielle. And there are amazing, caring teachers all around the country focused on giving kids the knowledge, skills, and life lessons that will carry them into successful lives. We love our teachers. Let's meet one of those remarkable teachers who was honored as the 2021 Teacher of the Year for Santa Barbara County. Hello, I'm Frank Karoshek. I teach English at San Marcos High School. Tomorrow, we'll be reading. Or I always start with just storytelling. Uh, I think story connects us, and so I share who I am to get them to share who they are. And also, it's been like easier to communicate um, and connect with others in the outside world. Like, so my slogan is we read to write to live. And so we read, not just scanning text, but we pay close attention, we consider, right? And then once we understand the conversation, we write about it. Then we live it. Because what good is all that talk if you don't live out what you say? So talk is cheap, right? It's a relief as a student to be around a teacher that is constantly willing to be like, yeah, I don't actually know all the time and I'm going to do the best that I can, and I hope and expect the same thing from you. Then I get ads, you know, for things I want, but what's the bad thing about that? Do you need that stuff? No, we get really confused about needs and wants, don't we? I never have before felt that my job is more important than it is now. It's very difficult right now, but my hope is in the students. They're our future, and they're seeing a lot of stuff that's kind of disgusting because we're really angry and we're not listening right? And if I can train them to see one another's humanity, maybe we can promote actual conversation, right? And it's more democratic because democracy is hearing from all the voices, even the ones you don't like. So I want us to act like a democracy. Yeah, so the alphabet is going to ruin everything because people won't think as well because they can rely on letters. The printing press is going to ruin everything. So these are the doomsdayers. And he's like, the internet's going to ruin everything. I learned definitely a lot about listening, um, not only from him as a role model, but from the assignments he gave us. I feel like one of the biggest takeaways I have is how to look at a variety of different perspectives. He just wants us to be the kind of people we want to be and the kind of people we are, and it just makes it so that we feel safe in the environment. I think one of the most important things about being an amazing teacher is that you have heart for everyone in the classroom and you have to believe that every student is able to achieve their best and Frank is one of those teachers who not only lives it as a teacher but also as a human being so I'm always in awe of being in his presence. So what's the problem according to Carr with artificial intelligence? Well, I love them. I love my students. And so I see the potential, but I get to plant seeds, right? So I have hope because the students fill me up all the time. And I think it's those seeds that I see that are sprouting, you know? And I can't wait to hear what they do 20 years down from when I retire, you know, and um, get to just kind of celebrate their stories. Well, ladies, I know uh, Teacher Appreciation Week was earlier this month, so seeing teachers like Frank uh, is very eye-opening to see what they have to go through to give our kids a, a good opportunity at success. Yeah, especially nowadays. I feel like teachers, they're dealing with so much more. I can't imagine being a teacher and having parents contacting me on social media, text message. Oh, there's so much. I think the parents appreciated the teachers more than anything this year because they had the kids home with them and they're like, please, somebody help. So yes. uh, shout out to our teachers. 
That's right. Well, up next, uh, Danielle Cheryl, school's still in session because we're about to get a lesson on what you need to purchase in the metaverse. Mm. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Now lately, Cheryl Quincy, we've been hearing a lot about crypto, NFTs, and this place called the Metaverse. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, yeah but do you feel like you understand all these things? Or no. guys, does it sound like it's coming from another dimension? If you're feeling left behind, stay right there because we have co-founder of White Sands Metaverse and Metaverse expert Adam Hollander here to break it all down for us. Welcome to Main Street Living. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Give us the quick version. What exactly is the metaverse? So a metaverse is very simply a, a digital online world where you're going to be able to do a variety of things that you'd otherwise do in real life only virtually. And so whether that be to meet people or play or interact or learn or conduct commerce, um, you could almost think of it to some extent like an extension of social media. And so 16, 17 years ago at the rise of, you know, Facebook and Friendster and MySpace, people might have been skeptical and said, you know, why would you spend your time on these websites talking to people? You could just, you know, call them on the phone or go and hang out with them at their house. And now you fast forward to 2022. This is a very important part of the way that we communicate, the way that we interact, the way that we meet people. And a metaverse really is an extension of that, where instead of going to a website where you have a profile picture, you're going to enter into a virtual world where you have an avatar. And you're going to be able to do a lot of the same things in terms of, you know, walking around and meeting people and having discussions. And, you know, like I said, working, playing, learning, buying things or otherwise. But it really is going to be an inevitable extension of the Internet and the way that we socially interact. Mm -hmm. Wow, Adam, and you talk about buying stuff, right? Like like the, the real estate market boom is crazy right now and people are starting to buy real estate in the metaverse. So so how does that even work or what do you get? <laughs> <laughs> so think of it like this. The same way that when you leave your house in the morning and then you go and live your life and maybe you yeah. go to work, maybe you go play, maybe you go do stuff with your kids, maybe you go shopping, but you want to have a home to come home to at the end of the day, a place where you could put your art on the walls and move your furniture around and invite your friends over and something that you feel like you can call home in the context of everything else that you're doing in your life. People are going to want to do the same thing and are already wanting to do the same thing inside of a digital world and inside of a metaverse. And so you can buy digital land or digital homes inside of these virtual worlds and you can customize it. And so inside of White Sands, the metaverse that my partner and I launched about a month, month and a half ago, you can already go in. We've sold thousands of plots of virtual land, hundreds of these you know, very luxurious master plan mansion like homes that are up on clifftops and people can enter into these homes. They can gate access and decide who can come in and who can't. They can build and customize what people can actually see when they walk onto that you know, plot of land or inside of that home. They're gonna be able to customize furniture, art up on the walls, pets, you know, vehicles that they can drive around the world. And this really becomes a place that they feel like they can call their own in the context of this you know, massively evolving digital world around them where there are going to be thousands of interactive experiences and games and ways to play and learn and earn and otherwise. Wow. wow, this is just such a different way of life. I was looking at Quincy's expressions as you were talking and my own expressions because we're going, what? So how much does something like this cost? And why would somebody want to do this rather than spend money on something tangible like a real home? You know, we've entered a phase of, you know, our digital lives of the internet where people are starting to care just as much about how they represent themselves digitally as how they do out in the physical world. And so you've seen a massive boom over the last year where you have you know, even major celebrities that are using NFTs as their profile images on Twitter or Instagram or social media. And they're using these as ways to represent their digital self. 
And people are using these same assets to join communities where they're meeting people from all around the world, where they're having physical and digital benefits and utility from the NFTs that they own. That is what's happening right now. And, you know, a few years from now, I think you're not even going to be accessing these worlds through a traditional computer screen. You're going to be putting your VR headset on and you're going to feel like you're actually immersed into this online digital environment where you can do all of these amazing things and, you know, interact with these incredible experiences with millions of people around you. And the way that you represent yourself inside that digital world is going to feel important to you. And the home that you own inside of that digital world where you can display art and trophies and customize it and invite people over and the way that, you know, that interacts with your overarching experience is going to feel very personal to you and already is today. Wow. 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 So uh, we are running short on time and I wish we had a little bit more time, but I have to ask you, like, why are people so anxious to buy into the white sands? That's your tropical island getaway. <laughs> so we have built White Sands on top of a technology platform called NFT Worlds. There are 10,000 unique worlds that can be owned by people or companies or projects where you can build just massive and relatively incredible experiences on top of them. And so if you've ever read Ready Player One, this whole concept of entering into a, you know, digital world where there are thousands of different worlds and experiences to go and sort of portal to and interact with. That's really mm -hmm. what's happening here. And so this entire NFT world's ecosystem is built on top of the Minecraft engine, which already has 170 million people that are using it every single month. It's very accessible. It's something that people already understand how to use. They already have Minecraft installed across a variety of devices. And so what we've done with White Sands is we've created this you know, immersive world where you can own land and these homes and customize your experience, but you're also going to be able to portal to these hundreds, thousands of other worlds on top of the same tech platform that have a standardized economic foundation with world Love token it. that you know, allow you to have utility of the NFTs that you own from place to place. And so the reason people are excited about White Sands, you know, one, if you go to our website, whitesands.game, you can see that what we've built is pretty magnificent. We're really, really proud of the quality of these homes and this world that we've built. It is available for use right now. There's a lot of these metaverse worlds out there that so have been cool. talking for yeah. years about the fact that they're going to open, but they haven't. White Sands is already available today. I was just looking today at someone that built a roller coaster on top of their land. And it is a oh my functioning gosh. roller coaster that people can walk up to and use. And I mean, it's yeah. just amazing the fact that, you know, you have this level of creativity that people can already apply to a metaverse world. Adam, I yeah. love your excitement here. I think Quincy and I are a little bit behind the times. All the information is on the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your knowledge. Thanks for having me. No problem. All right. Well, uh, Cheryl, clearly the metaverse is one way to see the impact and change in the world, right? And after the break, we're going to take a look at an impact of the Asian American Pacific Islanders and what they have in California. So we got more on the way. Stay right there. Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, the pandemic, obviously, ladies, has affected us all, but those with cultural or language barriers were especially hit hard. Yeah, the AAPI communities in Orange County, California, are focused on making their region better by ensuring that everyone in the community has access to all the services they need. That's right. Take a look at part three of the Orange County Grant Makers video series spotlighting the AAPI population in their community. API Task Force is uh, the short name for the Orange County Coronavirus Response Task Force. And um, the task force is a collaboration of nine Asian Pacific Islander organizations here in Orange County. And its mission was to respond collectively to serve Asian and Pacific Islander communities uh, to the pandemic. We are a large Asian county, often unrecognized for our size. In 2020, the census numbers are indicating that one in four of us, 
is mixed race Asian or Asian here in Orange County. The mission of the Orange County API Task Force is to work together to provide a culturally competent response um, and to provide education, training, referrals, and resources to the diverse API communities of Orange County. There were several needs to create this task force. First, um, our nation was not ready for COVID-19. No local community was completely ready, and we we were here as community-based organizations, the nine of us, um, to help our public health system respond in a way that was equitable, that reached deeply into communities. And uh, we wanted to lend a hand, provide our cultural and linguistic expertise to the response. The Cambodian Family Community Center was created in 1980 by a group of Cambodian refugees who escaped the Cambodian genocide regime in Cambodia. They survived the Cambodian genocide. They came through the refugee came, uh, camp to the United States. We have expanded our program and services to not just only serving our regional Cambodian population, but also other ethnic and minority groups in the United States as well. They are uh, value members of the society in the United States, in our community, but their voices have not been heard at the local uh, including city, county, and a state level, and also at the federal level. And we want to change that because their access to mental health services, social services, and other services have been impacted because of the lack of the language, the transportation barrier, and also their understanding about the system navigation, including the healthcare system as well. And we want to ensure that those communities are able to voice the needs at the local, state, and federal level. We had the same needs and the same issues, but in diverse communities within the API community. So we had to come together to leverage our resources, um, to learn from each other, and to synergize um, because together we were stronger. And then we used this collective, this collaboration, to focus on other issues. There were numerous initiatives coming down the pipeline, initiatives that addressed API community needs, and we stayed together, not just addressing our county's needs, but our state had some initiatives, and we stayed together for that. Other philanthropic organizations had um, wanted to address this issue, so we did that. And so I hope moving forward, um, the, the greater systems that be work with collaboratives like the API Task Force, because it is one go-to place where you can understand the breadth and the depth of our community uh, through one collective voice. And you can find out more information or watch the full series at ocgrantmakers.org. Lots of good stuff there. Yes, and lots of good stuff coming up. Next, our tax expert is back with some tax tips for small businesses. Back to Main Street Living. When you're running your own business, there are a lot of things to manage, guys. As a small business owner myself, I know it's almost impossible to be an expert on everything. That's right. And one thing that every business owner has to deal with, like it or not, is taxes. But have no fear, we do have a tax expert here to simplify even the most complicated tax questions for business owners. <music> Please welcome in tax attorney, Adam Brewer. Adam, thanks so much for joining us again on Main Street Living. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be back. So of course we have more tax questions for you. First of all, what are the types of business entities that business owners can use? Yeah, I had a feeling you'd ask this question. So <laughs> this time of year, this is when, you know, business owners probably just got uh, handed a pretty, pretty big tax bill. Um, and so naturally the next question is, you know, how can they save taxes? Uh, how can they save on taxes? And so that's where these business entities really, uh, they, they may come in. So, um, so yeah, what we're looking at is corporations or limited liability companies, you know, more commonly called LLCs. So, um, so definitely by using either a, a corporation or an LLC, 
um, tax owners may be able to, um, or business owners may be able to really save on, on taxes. Okay. Now, um, I have, um, I actually have a corporation uh, through, through my business. Now, um, I've noticed that, and you know, you have to pay the pre-tax, um, you know, like the estimated tax. So is there an overlap between the types of entities? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a ton of overlap. So initially, you know, LLC was kind of a distinct entity type. A corporation was a distinct entity type. And then, you know, as time goes on, they, you know, new additions to uh, the way they operate. And so now there's a ton of overlap. So yeah, you could have an LLC with an S corp election. Uh, it's going to be operated pretty similarly and, and function pretty much the same as someone who has a, a corporation and made that same S corp election. So um, it's really, it comes down to the elections um, as to, you know, where that overlap is. But, um, but yeah, that's always a common question, you know, when I talk to my clients and it's like, well, what type of entity do you have? Uh, it can create a lot of confusion. So that'd be something, you know, every business owner that has an entity, uh, that's something they should definitely try and figure out. So okay. Tell us why would a business owner want to set up an entity? Yeah. So beyond the tax savings, um, it just offers an extra level of protection between the business owner's personal assets, say their home and their business operations. So, uh, you know, no matter what business you operate, you're going to have some some exposure to to liability. So an entity like a corporation, like an LLC, it just puts that extra level of protection between between the business and then what the owner has uh, on their personal side. Yeah, and that's um, interesting, Adam. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add one more thing. Uh, sure. For a lot of my clients, it's this extra level of formality as well. So, um, you know, when you're operating your business as a sole proprietor, there's just this natural tendency to go like, oh, there's money in that account. I need to pay this personal expense or there's money in the personal account. I need to pay the business expense. Mm. Um, it's all well and fine during the year. The bills get paid. Um, but at the end of the year, when you're trying to, you know, come up with a profit and loss or go through your bookkeeping, it, it can be a, a real headache. Um, and so that extra level of formality, uh, it definitely can be a benefit. Yeah, that's exactly where I was about to go, because that was the first thing that they told me to say, you don't want to set up a sole proprietorship. Typically, people think, oh, yeah, I'll just be a sole proprietor. But you don't understand your business and your personal will mingle together. And if someone sues you, they're suing everything not just yeah. that business. So how can a business owner save on taxes with a specific entity? Okay. So for the most part, when we talk about tax savings, we're looking at like an S corp election. And so again, an LLC can do that. A corporation can do that. Um, but the net result is you want to save on what's called self-employment tax. So for 2022, uh, a business owner is going to by default pay self-employment tax on the first $147,000 of tax of taxable income. So that's 15.3%. Um, by doing an S corp election, putting yourself on payroll, uh, you can really drive down how much of your income you have to pay that 15.3% at. Um, and so that's, that's going to be the, the primary area of savings right there. Any other final considerations for anybody, a business owner, maybe thinking about setting up a business entity? Yeah, absolutely. So in my job as a tax controversy attorney, I almost see on the flip side, it's like a over creation of entities. Um, so I would just say, you know, an entity is not necessary for everyone doing their their business. If you're selling, you know, a thousand dollars a year of stuff on the Internet, you probably don't need uh, a legal entity. On the flip side, if you're operating, you know, a construction company or something like that, that's inherently uh, high risk, more likely to have high income, um, at least flowing through that entity. That's really, it's, you know, that's where it's really valuable, but it, it's going to be different for every business. So talk to an attorney, talk to, you know, tax professionals, really get a feel for it. Um, and then the final note is just as far as like tax savings go, um, there are costs to set up the entity, to maintain the entity. So you're looking at yearly filing, uh, payroll processing costs. So um, if it's just strictly a tax savings perspective, look at, you have to balance the other costs as well. Yeah. Well, clearly a plethora of information that you always provide to us, Adam. We appreciate you being on the show. Where can our viewers get in touch with you for more tax help? 
Yeah, like always, they can visit my website, triumphovertax.com, or feel free to pick up the phone. You can always give me a call, uh, 619-591-9500. There you go. We certainly appreciate you, Adam. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, Danielle, similar to running a business, uh, running water can supply the community with a much needed resource, right? So up next, we're going to head out west and see a pretty cool energy saving project. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Guys, as you know, water is one of our most important resources. And with the ongoing drought in the Southwest, it's even more precious than ever. Yes. And the Central Arizona Project, or CAP, CAP, delivers Colorado River water to residents and farms around Arizona. Yeah. So let's check out some of the ways that CAP is working to manage the water supply and help conserve this valuable resource. So the Central Arizona Project is a 336 mile long aqueduct that starts at the Colorado River near Lake Havasu City on the Arizona-California border and extends south of Tucson. It consists of 14 pumping plants that lift the water approximately 3,000 feet in elevation across the length of the system and it also includes 10 siphons and 4 tunnels. Um, as part of the CAP system we have Lake Pleasant which serves as a storage reservoir. So CAP serves cities, tribes, and agricultural districts in Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima County. Um, altogether, we serve approximately 80% of the state's population. In addition, since it's been operating since 1985, it's been estimated that it's contributed approximately $2 trillion to the Arizona economy. Um, the Colorado River originates from the Rocky Mountains. And so essentially snowpack from the Rocky Mountains melts and it's the Colorado River water that we transport. What we're seeing is that in our hotter and drier climate, even in good snow years, all of that snow is not necessarily running off into the rivers. That water is instead soaking into the ground, almost like a sponge. The soil is so dry and that water, it, the ground needs it. This year, the federal government declared a tier one shortage, which means that Arizona is getting less water. It comes to be a 30% reduction for our CAP supplies, which is primarily borne by our agricultural customers. So as part of our effort to reduce our carbon footprint, um, you know, CAP has implemented a four day work week schedule. Uh, we've recently added telecommuting days to reduce employees' carbon footprint. Um, we use solar power at remote sites, and we are beginning to add electric vehicles to our fleet. There are several easy things people can do at home to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, you can replace light bulbs with LED lights. You can increase your thermostat a few degrees in the summer or decrease it in the winter. Uh, you can select a green power option with your uh, local utility company, or you can carpool, walk, um, you know, ride share, bike, use different alternative modes of transportation. So if you're interested in learning more about Arizona's water supply or what CAP is doing to adapt or mitigate to the effects of climate change, um, I suggest going to knowyourwaternews.com. Yeah, Danielle Quincy, you really got to get creative with the water here and with climate change doing what it's doing. This is only going to get worse. So people really have to keep things in mind and do what they can to conserve water. Welcome back, Cheryl. She gives it to us straight, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is why we need a meteorologist on the show always. Nah. That's, that's right. Where you guys can learn more about the Central Arizona Project and what they are doing to adapt to the current water situation at knowyourwaternews.com. That's right. And straight ahead, we have more Main Street Living. Welcome back.
back into Main Street Living one last time. And of course, welcome back. Official show back in the books for Cheryl Nelson. So good to have you back. I'm yeah, so great. glad to be back. I've missed you guys so much. You guys don't even know. It would just make me sad to miss this. So it's been a fun show. Yes, it's been a fun show. Good to have you back. Good to have your meteorologist expertise. <laughs> and of course, if anyone have, has missed this show or any of our other shows, you can always go back and check them out on our Cox Contour app. Yes. And as always, we have brand new episodes of Main Street Living 9 p.m. local time on Mondays. So make sure you join us then as we take another stroll down Main Street. She's back!